I'm a seasoned survivalist. Been doing this since I was in Boy Scouts. The outdoors, the unfiltered truth of the world. It's where I feel the most at home. Took kind of a leap of faith this one time and decided to film my journey in solo survival amidst the dense, pristine forests of Oregon. Something about this raw, untouched nature always drew me towards it, and I really just wanted to share that with everyone else. It's a wild world out there. I was surrounded by nothing but the tall trees and the distinct melody of nature. Everything was quiet except for the sound of water flowing nearby, birds singing their songs, and the wind whispering through the evergreen branches. You could almost taste the freshness in the air. My routine out there was simple. Wake up at first light, have a rough breakfast of nuts, berries, or any edible plant I could forage. And then it was lights, camera, action. I'd film myself working around the camp, sharpening sticks for traps, making a fire, you know, the wilderness 101 stuff. But it's not entirely about teaching the technicals. It's about sharing the heartache, the thrill, the pure untamed emotions of living through the days like our ancestors used to, fighting tooth and nail for every sunset. The cameras were my only companions, capturing every move, every moment, sharing my solitude. One day, I left my prime campsite near the river to explore a bit deeper into the wild. I often did this to better understand the lay of the land, get a feel of the territory, and to figure out what resources were available. But something felt different that day, though I couldn't quite put my finger on it. As I got deeper into the woods, the air felt heavy and strangely still. Every so often, I would catch a very distinct and putrid smell in the air. It was stale to the senses and enough to put you off your breakfast. I had never smelled anything like it before. I ventured further keeping my wits about me as any trained survivalist would. I filmed everything I came across. One odd thing I found was this massive, distinct dent in the foliage. An animal sign, maybe? Sometimes deer will bed down and make shapes like that in the underbrush. But this was far larger than any deer bed I had ever seen. I made a mental note of it and kept going. It's always important to stay aware of your surroundings. You never know what could be lurking around. Life in the wild is unpredictable like that. Not far from the foliage bed, I heard a loud grunt that resonated through the clearing. Now, I'm not a man that scares easily. I've run into all kinds of wildlife out here, but this was different. There was an eerie, uncanny feeling that hung in the air. There was nobody else out there for miles, so whatever I was about to encounter, I had to deal with it by myself. It was one thing to hear strange sounds in the forest, but it was another to actually encounter a dangerous predator. I felt eyes on me, but I couldn't discern their location. I'm sure everyone has had the feeling of being watched, but this was more like I was being hunted. Things around me seemed out of place. There was an echo of heavy footsteps in the thinning dusk light and shadows flitting about amongst the trees. The strange growls in the far off distance put my senses on high alert, but I was yet to find their source. When I returned to camp, I felt the sense of unease grow. That same putrid smell was incredibly strong near my shelter. Food in my storage was left untouched, but objects were out of place. It was clear to me that something or someone had been there. I left trail cameras up around my camp, mostly to capture myself as I was building my shelter and doing other tasks around camp. I decided to review the footage from my hidden cameras, not knowing what I'd find. There was nothing at first, just me going about my routines. Then suddenly, the screen filled up with a humongous hulking creature. There it was in full view, a colossal shape, standing upright on two massive legs, easily eight or nine feet tall if I had to guess. Its muscular frame was covered in a thick coat of brownish red hair, but it wasn't a bear, not in the slightest. I paused the video, and there before me was a face unlike anything my imagination could have created. It was like I was staring at a hybrid of a man and an ape, or perhaps some long, long cousin in the evolution of humanity. Its forehead was prominent, and it had these deep, sunken eyes that bore a look of intelligence. The eyes seemed too small for its face, but they were uncannily human. The jaw was heavy set with a jutting chin. The realization left me in an anxious awe a cocktail of fear and fervor coursing through me. 
I was out there in the woods with Sasquatch, and I was a guest, an intruder in his territory. I wondered if those noises it was making were warnings for me to get out, and suddenly I was scared. The footage made it all undeniable. Even a skeptic like me had to accept the glaring truth. It was too late to hike out that night, so I settled into camp, hoping the creature would leave me alone. After a restless night, I decided not to press my luck. I broke camp and headed out. Upon returning home, the encounter continued to weigh heavily on my mind. My camera footage has been met with quite a bit of disbelief, and I don't blame them. In fact, I would have had trouble believing it if I had not seen it myself. I sometimes watch the footage back and it serves as a humble reminder that we aren't truly alone out there. The wilderness is more wild than we could ever comprehend. You'd think life in the Australian outback would be straightforward. After all, there's not much out here except for red kangaroos and endless stretches of arid land. And yet, here in our tiny town, things have been getting mighty strange. For the past few weeks, we've had a string of disappearances. Not the kind of thing you expect around here. They've all happened around the same area, a secluded watering hole at the edge of town. It was used by wildlife and locals alike to cool off from the hot summer sun. Now, I'm not the town sheriff or anything. Hell, the nearest station is miles away. But I've been here longer than most. When you've lived in a place for 35 years, you kind of feel a responsibility to step up when things go south. And things were heading south. Me and a couple of the lads took it upon ourselves to do some poking around. We canvassed the area, spoke to the folks who'd last seen the missing, and asked all the usual questions. Of course, there were other investigations going on, but they weren't getting any answers. Our next stop was the watering hole. I've known this patch of water for as long as I can remember. I've seen it flood, dry up, and once back in 86. I even fished a roux out of it, but I'd never seen it dark like this. The sun was beating down hard that day, near enough to fry an egg on the ground, but when I stood at the water's edge, I could feel a chill. The birds were quiet, which was a damn oddity on its own. Some of the lads thought it was because one of the neighbors, Rogers we always called him, had a habit of shooting at anything that moved. He said it kept his eyes sharp, but he wasn't outside. We could see his house from the water's edge, and there wasn't any movement down there. There was a faint odor in the air that reminded me of the time I found a dead snake under my outdoor freezer. It was a sickly, rotting stench that clung to the back of my throat. It was so bad you could taste it. But the weirdest of all was the water itself. It was strangely stagnant, barely a ripple breaking its glass-like surface. Now, if you've ever been near a water source in the Australian summer, you'd know it practically buzzes with life. Frogs, insects, birds, even crocs too if you're in the right place. But this place was quiet, unnaturally quiet. Whilst the lads were joking around, my eyes were drawn to the frothing bubbles that started popping up from the pool. My mind was racing, and then something starts to emerge. We all stood there frozen in place as we watched it. A massive being started to rise out of the water. And I mean, this beast was truly massive. Easily more than six feet tall. It was surreal, like something out of those cheap monster flicks I watched as a kid. The beast was covered in scales, sharp and jagged. They were all over its body, making it obvious that whatever was standing before us was cold-blooded, even though none of us knew what exactly it was. I know this is going to sound crazy, but it was like the mix of a human and a dinosaur. The form was eerily similar to a human. The beast could stand up on two legs and appeared to have the ability to walk that way, though it stayed in the water. It had hulking arms tipped with black claws, and legs that had a similar anatomy to that of a man. But the worst part of it was its face. The creature's head was distinctly reptilian. The eyes were yellow and slitted like a snake's. Whatever human characteristics I saw in the creature's body, I didn't see in the face. There seemed to be an intelligence behind its eyes, but there was no humanity there. I don't know how long we stood there staring at it. Maybe we were afraid to move or maybe we were all just in shock. It broke the silence when it hissed. It was a sound so cold and alien that it froze my blood in my veins. 
Despite the horrifying call, it didn't come out of the water towards us. Instead, after what felt like an eternity, it turned around and slid back into the water, disappearing without a trace. I stood there a while longer, stuck in a sort of stunned disbelief. It took one of the lads clapping his hand on my shoulder to jolt me back to reality. But I didn't say a word about what had happened to them. Not a single word. Instead, I let them carry on joking, even joining in myself. In the days following, I battled with whether or not to share my encounter. People around here are easily spooked. An outlandish story about a dinosaur creature lurking in our watering hole. It could cause a real panic. Or worse, I could end up in a room with rubber walls. I was afraid no one would believe me, but I didn't want to let it go. What if someone else went missing, and it was because they took a swim in that pool, and I didn't say anything? Still, no one was going to believe me about this reptilian creature, so this is what I did. I went out and made the most official-looking signpost I could, and wrote up a blurb about the water testing positive for E. coli. I knew nobody would swim in that, and I went out one night when no one was around, and I hammered the sign into the ground. I was terrified the creature would show itself again, but it didn't. Maybe it wasn't the greatest solution, but we haven't had any disappearances since. So the next time you see signs telling you not to swim in the water, just know that it might not be for the reasons you think. Be careful out there. I'm a ranger at Yellowstone National Park, right near where Wyoming, Montana, and Idaho meet. It's a huge place, full of geysers, hot springs, and the famous Old Faithful. It was late in the day, time for us rangers to start securing the area. Tourists get caught up in all the sights and lose track of time. For example, as dusk approaches, I have to make sure the boardwalk around Old Faithful is clear. You see, the park can feel quite different when cloaked by darkness. Even people from the city can feel it. The park seems different when it gets dark. There are all sorts of stories about the park, like vengeful spirits, strange animals, and voices in the wind. But after years here, that kind of stuff never really got to me. After all, I always thought these stories were just for scaring visitors around a campfire. But that day, I was about to see something really unexpected. I was following my standard routine, walking along the boardwalk I had trodden countless times. The hisses and gurgles from the hot springs and geysers almost sounded like they were talking, but I was used to their noises. I found it comforting. I kept my eyes on the boardwalk, looking for any tourists still around. I was really focused until I saw a silhouette in the distance. There was someone standing too close to the edge, right near Old Faithful, which is not allowed at all. This being was on two legs, with big shoulders and maybe a tail. The profile was human, but not entirely. I called out. My shout echoed through the quiet, and then suddenly there was this low, rough growl. It sent a shock of fear through me which was a sensation that was foreign to my years of working in the park. This was the moment when my rational mind gave way to instinct, signaling danger. That shock, plus the day getting darker, made everything feel a lot scarier. Being a ranger, you're told to be prepared for various encounters, but deep inside, you're never really conditioned for an unexpected one. As I moved cautiously closer, flashlight sweeping, my mind raced, trying desperately to piece the vague features of the creature into something familiar, something I could understand. My breath hitched as the figure shifted, its silhouette morphed, changing into a form that was not ordinary human anatomy. It was then I noticed the head, too angular to be human, more like a reptile. Those myths that I never believed in suddenly started to feel real. A sudden burst of steam from Old Faithful tarnished my view, the atmospheric pressure shifting and echoing, the silent tension woven through the air. It was almost as if the forces of nature were both signaling and masking what lay in wait. And this was when the dusk-drenched silence started to feel heavy. It was turning out to be anything but a routine park patrol. As the steam cleared in the night's chill, I saw it more clearly. The creature was huge, just unfolding in front of me. Its eyes were bright, really yellow and kind of calculating, staring down at me from its weird V-shaped head. 
It looked sort of human, but only at first glance. Looking at it straight on was dizzying, scary but somehow fascinating too. I stepped back fast, my heart thumping loud, almost like the geysers around me. My instincts screamed danger, but an odd fascination kept my feet rooted to the ground. It had these huge black claws, and it moved so smoothly, which was weird against the straight lines of the boardwalk. In that moment, I felt like it was watching me, outsmarting me. It was like it knew more than I could even understand. This was way scarier than any ranger's nightmare or campfire story. So tall, so utterly foreign, and so menacingly present. I could barely breathe. I kept backing away but couldn't take my eyes off it. I couldn't help but feel its gaze following my every move, with a sadistic interest that sent shivers down my spine. I neither confronted nor ran, but retreated, compelled by a primal urge to put a safe distance between the formidable unknown and myself. Finally, after what seemed like eons, I reached my ranger station, taking one last look over my shoulder. And there it was, the figure, quiet and ever foreboding, sinking back into the Yellowstone wilderness under the cloak of the night. The natural hum of the park picked up again, the silence broken, indicating the ordeal was over. That night was no peaceful slumber, and no subsequent night was either. The encounter changed everything. Now, every rustle of leaves or breaking twig puts me on alert. The park which was once my sanctuary became a vast mystery, holding secrets far terrifying than I could have ever imagined. Retelling this, I find myself questioning its reality, the strange encounter playing tricks on my seasoned mind. The way twilight plays tricks with shadows, yet the image of the creature, its yellow eyes still burning brightly against the dark backdrop of my memory, it lingers. I cannot decide what was worse, the encounter itself or the aftermath. Both have not just put the park, but also my very sense of reality into question. Ever since, on patrol, I keep looking into the trees, drinking too much coffee on night shifts trying to convince myself it was just stress or a weird story. But one thing for sure has been carved into the bedrock of my life. I have witnessed the extraordinary. I've touched the fears stowed deeply into my rationality, and it now seems a colossal task to reclaim the sense of peace and order. Maybe Yellowstone was always like this, and it's just the way I see it that's changed. Either way, Yellowstone isn't just another national park for me anymore. It holds something far more profound, something that speaks of the world's hidden wonders, and perhaps its hidden terrors. I've got a story for you. This one happened a couple of years ago. I'd recently started dating this girl, Lisa, and decided a picnic would be the perfect date. Living in the heart of Colorado, we had no shortage of beautiful nature spots to choose from. We ended up settling on this picturesque meadow surrounded by towering pines, about an hour outside of Denver. I'd spent the previous day stuffing a cooler with sandwiches, cheeses, and fruits. I tried to go all out. After all, Lisa was a city girl. She'd only just moved to Colorado, and I wanted to show her the relaxation of a laid-back, outdoorsy lifestyle. This meadow was perfect. It was like something you'd see on a postcard. We laid out the red blanket, started unpacking the food, and were having a hell of a good day. The sun was beaming and there was just a hint of breeze. Lisa was laughing at my terrible impressions, and for a while everything was going well. Then, feeling the heat of the day, we both dozed off. I don't know how long we slept, but it was easily close to an hour. I remember being awoken by a sudden coldness. Not just the kind of cold from a passing cloud blocking the sun. It felt unnatural, electrical almost. I stirred, sat up and rubbed my eyes, and that's when I first noticed it. A figure, lurking at the periphery of the meadow. It was a dark smudge against the vibrant colors. It was hard to make out any specific details from that distance, but something about it put me on edge, and a deep sense of dread clenched around my chest. Was it the way it seemed to hover just at the edge of the forest? The way it seemed somehow both solid and formless at the same time? The thing, whatever it was, stayed in my sight for the better part of an hour. 
We stayed close to each other on the blanket, whispering about how we were torn between an urge to flee and a weird curiosity that held us rooted to the spot. Admittedly, we were both freaked out but tried passing it off as a bear or some other wildlife. But the sense of unease stayed. It didn't help that the figure was unsettlingly manlike, but hazy, almost blurry. It was like looking through frosted glass. Our little relaxing picnic had been tainted by a sense of dread that was hard to shake off, at least as long as that thing was still there. Then began the sounds. Soft at first, a low hum that could easily be dismissed as the hum of insects or distant river, but it began to increase in volume, becoming a guttural, growl-like echo that seemed to resonate from both everywhere and nowhere. The last thing I remember is grabbing Lisa's hand and scrambling to our feet. Our abandoned picnic left as a sad little island of normality in a rapidly changing landscape of fear. Whatever it was, it stayed in my periphery, never allowing me to look at it directly. It was like a smudge in a pair of glasses that you can't ever clean or a blind spot in your vision field. I remember Lisa muttering a low, scared, what the hell is that? Her voice barely audible over the unsettling growling. The shadow was growing larger. I don't know how, but it was significantly taller than it was a moment ago. And what I'd previously thought to be a trick of perspective appeared eerily like horns protruding awkwardly on its head. I didn't know what to say. All I knew was that we had to get out of there. So with Lisa's hand gripped in mine, so hard it hurt, we began running as fast as we could in the opposite direction. Lisa was sobbing now, terrified, but I didn't look back. I didn't want to see it. I don't know how I knew, but I knew if I looked back, that would be it. With a sense of dread, I could smell it now. A strong scent of sulfur and something burning. By the time we reached the safety of our car, the menacing figure had vanished. We jumped in, and I roared the engine to life. Lisa was shaking as she turned around, her eyes wide as saucers. It's gone, she said. Looking back on that event has never been easy. We'd run away from something we didn't truly understand. We knew what we'd seen wasn't human. It wasn't natural. We had no proof, though. I still can't step foot in that meadow. But you want to know the scariest part? When we got back to my home, we found a black feather. The damn thing followed us home. We never saw that figure again. But the smell, that terrible sulfuric smell, I would get whiffs of it in the house for weeks. It finally faded. But the fear, well, the fear never goes away. I can't prove we met a demon that day, but what else could it be? Remember, not everything is as it seems, and sometimes a beautiful day can turn into your worst nightmare. Stay safe out there. I've been a park ranger for about 20 years now, operating mostly around Utah's Goblin Valley State Park. I've come across some odd folks and had a few close encounters with wildlife over the years, but nothing I'd ever considered unnatural. But that changed soon enough. The first report started trickling in sometime around late May, if my memory serves. Folks in the park said they heard strange clicking noises during the night. They all had the same story, and all of them said the clicking sounded displaced like it was metallic in nature and coming from all directions at once. Definitely not something you would expect to hear in the woods. Being the main and pretty much only ranger in these parts, it was my responsibility to check things out. Plus, the last thing I needed was some city slickers running around in a panic, claiming we got some strange creature living in our caves. That day began as usual. Rig checked, radio tuned into the local station, coffee in the thermos. I swung by the welcome center to make sure all was in order there and then began my patrol route with the reports in mind. The first few hours were unremarkable. I checked out the camping sites, offered advice to a couple of rookie campers on bear safety, and helped in a tense moment of a family trying to locate their wandering child. But honestly, it was just another day in the life. During my lunch break, under the bright and unrelenting Utah sun, I chose one of the more remote trails to check out. It was an area several of our visitors had made reports from. I parked my rig in the shadow of the towering sandstone formations, 
and munched on my sad excuse for a sandwich for a minute before heading out. The sound of the wind rustling the distant brush was the only thing that interrupted the desert silence. I hiked around for a little bit, really just wandering without any real direction, hoping to catch wind of the reported clicking. If I heard it, I figured I'd find a reasonable explanation for it soon enough. Maybe a trail sign post had come loose and was banging in the wind. That's usually how it goes. We get strange reports from time to time, and upon investigation, it's always something mundane because there is always a logical explanation. But then, as I neared a shallow ravine, the air just changed. Have you ever walked into a room and immediately knew you were unwelcome? It was exactly like that. But this was my park, and I wasn't going to be spooked out this easy. So, I'm standing there by the ravine, feeling this sense of dread creeping up when I hear it. It was definitely the clicking sound. It was a dizzying sequence of clicks and chitters, precisely echoing the descriptions of it in the reports. I have to admit I was a little uneasy at this point. I noted the direction of the sound and cautiously moved towards it. Turning a bend, I saw something move, a quick flash of something moving incredibly fast and utterly silent. I could only make out a vague shape, pale, somewhat human-like, and crawling on all fours. My heart pounded in my chest. You know those moments when it feels like you've stumbled into something you shouldn't have. But there I was, straining my eyes in the broad daylight, trying to wrap my head around what I had just seen. Was it a ghost? Some type of ghoul? A demon? The logical part of me thought maybe it was just some sick person, pale and emaciated, who was plagued with some mental illness that brought them out into the wild in such a state. But deep down, I knew that was not the case. I hightailed it back to the truck, my brain buzzing in an adrenaline-fueled haze. I wanted to know what that thing was, but I didn't want to know bad enough to stick around. Back at the Welcome Center, I took a moment to collect my thoughts. I barely remember the drive home. There was nothing in my 20 years of experience that could have prepared me for such an occurrence. I didn't have answers, but I'm not even sure I wanted them at that point. Whatever that thing was, Something deep in my senses just knew that it was dangerous. You know, all those stories of people going missing around national parks. I always thought it was just ill-prepared tourists that got caught in bad weather or unsuitable terrain. But now, I think maybe there is another reason, and I think you know what I'm talking about. I tried telling some of my colleagues in town about what I'd seen, but that went nowhere really fast. I just got strange looks or jokes tossed my way but I'm sticking with my guns. My mind and my body both know what really happened. There's undoubtedly more to the wilderness than meets the eye. And we humans are crazy if we think we know everything about the universe that there is to know. Stay safe, everyone. I used to run marathons. I wasn't particularly good at it. But, I guess you could say, it was a challenge that I felt compelled to face, to take me out of my comfort zone. I can still feel the intense rhythm of long-distance running, my heart pounding, sweat tracing lines down my forehead, and that familiar burn in my lungs and legs. It's a grueling experience that pushes your physical limits. They always talk about that runner's high, but for me it was just the grit and perseverance that came with pushing your body to its limits that drew me into participating in these tests of endurance. One race in particular stands out though, and it wasn't because of anything that happened during the race itself. Well, not directly. It was a marathon through the Pine Barrens in New Jersey, a unique blend of desolate wilderness and bustling suburbs. It was a unique setting for a race, more exotic than the usual urban marathons I used to run, and that's what drew me to it. On top of that, I was also trying to bounce back from an old knee injury, and I figured the softer terrain would help, considering the usual pavement runs were becoming a bit too harsh on my aging joints. But I digress. Let's get back to the race. Race day dawned clear, the sun beating down with intense summer warmth. There was a bit of chatter about the notorious legend of the Jersey Devil among the other runners. A bit of local lore intended to spice up the event. Everyone was taking it lightly a bit of pre-race banter to calm the nerves. The race started with the usual marathon scene. Cheers, 
the rhythmic sound of running shoes, and the heavy breaths of fellow runners. But as I delved deeper into the trail, the crowd thinned, and the quiet serenity of the barrens began to take over. In the pine barrens, the twisted pines and winding paths gave a sense of another world, silent and mysterious. Every now and then, a fellow runner would pass by, offering me a nod or a wave of encouragement. But it was mostly just me, my breath, and the crunch of my shoes on the trail. As the race progressed and the crowd dispersed, I found myself running on my own. Now, don't get me wrong, I've run in forests and trails before, but the solitude and stillness of this are was unsettling. A sharp, musty smell lingered in the air, reminiscent of sulfur. I thought maybe I was imagining it, you know, pushing myself too hard, maybe a sign of exhaustion setting in. But the thing is, that smell, it grew stronger as I ran deeper into the wilderness, stronger to the point where it wasn't something I could just ignore. Then I heard it, strange, unidentifiable noises unlike anything in a normal forest. Not like the rustles and whispers of a typical forest, but bizarre, almost bestial. I tried not to let it bother me though and continued on, lost in the rhythm of the run the serene environment, and my growing discomfort. Everything was fine, or at least as fine as it can be when you're pushing your body to its limits, until I saw it. It was standing, silhouetted against the low sun, feet away from the trail I was supposed to follow. This was a strange figure, not just another runner who happened to venture off the path, but something towering, sinister. At first, I decided to keep running. Maybe fatigue was finally taking its toll, and I was beginning to see things. Until I got closer, it was undeniably alive, and definitely not human. It towered over me, its height reminiscent of a small tree. Its body, skeletal and lizard-like, had scales that caught the weak sunlight. Its bat-like wings added an ominous touch to its form. A creature out of a medieval legend, for sure. The head itself was a sight I'll never forget. The head, a grotesque fusion resembling a goblin and a horse, defied understanding. Its eyes, glowing a fierce red, felt like they were dragging me into an abyss, an intense fear that was more than visual. It was visceral. Its long, eerily lithe tongue flickered out of a jaw that resembled an exterior skull, a sight that turned my stomach. As I stood there, frozen in my terror, it turned its head towards the distant line of runners, and in its glowing red eyes, I thought I saw a flicker of understanding, maybe even amusement, as if it relished the fear it caused. It was then that I remembered the smell of sulfur. It wasn't my fatigue. It was 100% this creature. Adrenaline kicked in. I ran, faster than I'd ever run in my life, feeling the raw fear pulsing in my veins. Eventually, I got back into the thick of the race and the cheers of the crowd as I bolted out of the trail and towards the finish line seemed both a world away and a lifesaver. That sight, that creature, haunted my eyes, the way spots do when you stare at the sun too long. Safe within the crowd, I turned back, half expecting to see the creature looming at the edge of the forest, but there was nothing. I breathed out, relieved and confused. Was I so tired and paranoid that I hallucinated the infamous Jersey Devil. Collecting my marathon medal, I shook, not from exhaustion, but from an unexplainable terror. Today, that devil-like figure skulking near the trail is etched in my memory. Looking back now, I don't know what to believe. Was it the real Jersey Devil, some elaborate hoax, or my mind playing horrific tricks? That experience, chilling even now, overshadows the physical challenge of the marathon. It's a stark reminder that sometimes the real test lies in facing the unexpected, the psychological shadows that lurk in memory. Not long ago, I managed to cross off a major item on my bucket list, scuba diving off the coast of Scotland. The rocky coastline harbors some of the key diving spots in the world. I've always been fascinated by underwater exploration. The deep blue darkness, the mysterious shadows, fish darting about as if they're playing hide and seek, and if you're lucky, 
the thrill of finding something like a lost relic or sunken treasure. On this particular trip, it was a mild summer day when we embarked from the local marina. Dressed in my diving gear, I followed the guide into the water. His name was Ian. He was local to the area and had been leading guided dives for years. As we slipped into the temperate waters, I couldn't help but feel a childlike sense of excitement. That's what diving does to me. Each time feels like the first. The adrenaline rush when you dive deeper, it never gets old. Not for me. The waters off the Scottish coast aren't the crystal clear tropical kind you see on all the internet videos. They are darker here, more enigmatic. The visibility depends entirely on the sun and the currents. Though it was a challenge, I was eager to explore and unravel the secrets I felt were waiting for me below. About half an hour into the dive, following a trail left by a myriad of local sea critters, I stumbled upon what looked like an ancient underwater cave. It was half hidden by a thick growth of seaweed. This spot was not on Ian's usual route. I could see by his surprised expression that he too was unaware of its existence. But there's no thrill without a bit of risk. So taking a moment to check our gear, we ventured in. Inside, the walls of the cave were speckled with marine life. These tiny creatures had made a whole microcosm separate from the world outside. Our torches glided across the cave floor and revealed an assortment of brilliant objects glistening in the darkness. My heart leaped in my chest as I realized what these objects were. Sunken treasures, ancient coins blanketed by barnacles, jewel-encrusted goblets, pearls. There was even what looked like a royal crest, half buried under the silt. I couldn't believe what we had found. And then, out of nowhere, I felt a sudden shift in the water. I glanced at Ian. His face was masked by poor visibility, but I could still sense an unease in him. His headlamp darted wildly through the water, illuminating bursts of sand and sudden showers of tiny bubbles. Something else was there with us, something that belonged to the underwater cave. There was something living in here. I heard a low rumble grip the water around us. It was then that a sense of dread hit me. I can't explain what caused it, but I just knew we had to get out of there. And as we hurriedly began our retreat, I saw something there in the water. At first, it was just a darting shadow, but it was much larger than a fish or any marine creature I'd ever seen. It was just at the edge of my vision, beyond the reach of our torchlights. The mysterious rumble grew stronger echoing in the watery silence. I caught a fleeting glimpse of something. It wasn't a fish or shark or turtle or any sea creature I'd ever encountered before. I saw the shadow flicker again, this time in the cave's entrance. A thwack, like a whip cutting the air, echoed around me creating disorienting ripples in the water. I risked stealing a glance back towards the cave, only for my blood to turn ice cold. What I saw there defies all sanity and rationality. Sometimes I try to convince myself it was all just a bad dream, but I know what I saw down there, and I know it was real. Looking back at me, from the dark abyss of the cave, were two enormous glowing orbs. These weren't bioluminescent fish. No, these were eyes. Eyes as big as dinner plates, and filled with an ominous hypnotic light that seemed to pulsate in the murky water, like they were trying to draw you in. The creature moved further into the light. I could not believe what I saw before me in the entrance of that cave. There were rows upon rows of sharp, oversized teeth that reflected pure white against our lights. The creature had a long, scaled, sinuous body that wrapped around itself like a snake. It appeared to have some type of gills or fins on either side of its face, almost like a dragon out of a storybook. It was entirely too large to be anything known to inhabit these waters. This thing was big enough to sink a boat without much of a struggle at all. Suddenly, all those stories I had heard about sea monsters didn't seem so far-fetched anymore, but the only thought in my mind right then was to get the hell out of there. Ian must have been on the same page because we swam like maniacs, only looking back to make sure the monster wasn't following. Every splash, every sound was amplified by the absolute silence of the underwater world and every small fish turning in the dark seemed like the beast was after us. We surfaced gasping for air. The boat was nearby, and we hastily clambered aboard. 
Both of us were trembling. The shock and fear we felt was crystal clear in our eyes. Ian revved the engine and we pulled away from that wretched spot, leaving the treasures and the horror of that creature far behind. Later, wrapped in warm blankets, sipping on strong coffee, Ian and I shared strained smiles. We'd escaped the clutches of a real-life sea monster, a creature whose existence will be questioned and mocked by non-believers. But ignorance sounds like bliss when compared to the memories of those terrifying eyes I saw in the cave that day. I still dive. I couldn't give it up entirely, but I stick to busy places and clearer waters. The Scottish Sea holds its secrets close, but I expect the truth will surface in time. It was just another morning in Plainfield, Iowa, in the spring of last year. Waking up before dawn has always been a part of this way of life. Or maybe it's just the habit. The difference is, as a farmer, your clock is the rooster crowing in the distance, signaling the start of a new day of work. Out here, miles away from the nearest neighbor, we take pride in being stewards of the land. My family's been maintaining this Iowa farmland for generations. We've got about 200 acres of corn on the farm. It's a tough job, but it keeps us busy. That morning, I remembered an eerie calm wash over the fields. You know when you just sense that something's out of place. A thick, early morning fog made it hard to see the fields in detail. But even through the fog, I could tell something was wrong. The fog lifted and the sun rose, and I headed out to the fields. Rows of green corn stalks lay flattened, intricately spiraling out from a central point like a dizzying maze. I'd seen crop circles on the news before and pegged them as pranks by people with nothing better to do. But this was different. Now, I'm not a man who leaps to conclusions. I've learned not to do that on the farm, but I couldn't explain how anyone could have achieved such an intricate design overnight and without me hearing a thing. Hell, we don't even have fancy drones in this part of the state. Not that any local prankster would have the money for one. The crop circles got me thinking. It wasn't about the lost harvest, but more about the mystery itself. I guess the farmer and me saw a problem to investigate. Not a paranormal mystery, but a pest problem with an unusually creative approach. I decided on setting up some surveillance around the farm. I didn't even tell my wife. She would have thought that I had lost my marbles. I had my old hunting stuff lying around including a night vision trail camera I used to track wildlife during deer season. I dusted off the old thing and set it up on the edge of one of the fields near the crop circles. As day turned into night, I settled in the den, my eyes fixed upon the grainy feed coming from the camera. Every motion sensor blip, every rustle of the wind, heightened my anticipation as the tall silhouette of the cornfield swayed ominously under the gray shroud of the night my eyes struggled to adjust to the grainy black and white feed. Sometime around midnight, I saw a figure. It was barely visible from a distance. A wiry figure emerged from the rows, moving with an ethereal grace. It was skinny, with a head too big for its frame and features that were humanoid but grotesquely stretched out. The night vision camera didn't pick up color, so I didn't know if it had that famous alien gray skin. All I knew was that it stood with an uncanny, lanky silhouette against the backdrop of my cornfield. The figure stood still for a few moments looking towards my house with those big, black, oval eyes. I held my breath. My blood ran cold, and I could hear my heartbeat in my ears. I struggled to wrap my mind around what was happening. I know what it looked like, but it was like my mind didn't want to believe it. The creature walked around the flattened corn stalks and looked to the sky. Maybe it had friends around, I don't know. But as it was scanning the area, it noticed the camera. It looked right into. It was like it was staring right through me. I knew that it couldn't see me, but it felt like it could. I was terrified. And then, just like that, it was gone. The creature disappeared right into thin air, as if it had never been there. The sudden stillness of the field was almost as terrifying as the encounter itself. As I sat there, my mind raced. What was it doing there? And how did it recognize the camera? I didn't know. All I knew was that during the course of one night, my world turned upside down. I didn't sleep for the rest of the night, 
Just sat there in front of the camera feed as the adrenaline left my body and daybreak began to light up the room. The following days were filled with uneasy thoughts. I felt like I was straddling the line between two worlds. A part of me tied to the mundane practicality of running a farm. The other part in constant fear of the unknown entity that I had seen on the trail cam. I was plagued with thoughts. Was the creature alone? Would it come back? And why here? What did it want? Every creak of the house at night. Every unintended movement in the dark. My mind twisted it into signs of the creature returning. Many nights later, I am still here watching the fields through my trail camera. Just a simple farmer and an unlikely witness to the unknown. I wish I hadn't seen what I had seen, but now I can't stop thinking about it. I have more trail cams set up these days, hoping to catch them if they come back. Thus far, I've only caught images of deer and foxes wandering in the night. No signs our friends have returned. No crop circles. No nothing. I'm afraid I'll never know what the creature wanted or why it came to my field. I can only sit here and wonder. I remember the night like it was yesterday. It was two years back in the dead of summer, and I was in Michigan visiting a few friends around Lake Superior. The whole day had been filled with great food, laughter, and the best company. I really fell in love with the place. Those lakes, they are more like seas. You can stand at the edge and look across the water, and you won't see any sign of land at all. It's hard to describe unless you've been there and seen it for yourself. Those waters are absolutely colossal. We were all still on the beach when night fell around us. We were so entranced in conversation that we either didn't care or didn't notice. There's something otherworldly about Lake Superior at night, with the moonlight reflecting off its surface and the way the waves gently lap against the shoreline. We had a bonfire going, and we showed no signs of turning in for the night. At some point, we were daring each other to go in the water. If you've never been to Superior, the water is frigid, even in the summer months. It's like jumping into a bucket of ice. I was the first to go. The moment my toes hit the water, I was shaking, but that didn't stop me. It seemed a little less cold when I fully submerged myself, or maybe the shock was just wearing off. The water was still, and I could see the moon's silvery light bouncing off the water as I swam. I was lost in this serene beauty utterly oblivious to the world around me. I swam out a ways from the beach, and suddenly I was overcome by a weird sensation of being watched. I looked around, but I couldn't see much of anything in the dark. I tried to shrug it off and continue my swim, but it wouldn't leave me alone. With my heart beginning to beat audibly faster, I decided to make my way back to shore. Maybe it was just the cold getting to me, or maybe it was something else. However, just as I was about to turn around, I heard something that froze me in place. A snarl, like a dog, echoed off the water's surface. I circled around in place, trying to find the source of the noise, but I couldn't see anything. Not long after the chilling growl, a smell began to waft towards me. It was something rancid, like old rotten garbage you'd find in a city alleyway. It was so pungent it made my eyes water. The sudden intensity was unbearable. I knew something strange was nearby, but I was still unaware of its identity. I could barely muster the courage to turn around, towards the smell. In the distance, on the shoreline, I could make out a dark silhouette. It was huge and human-like in form, but even in the dim lighting, I could tell that it was anything but. As I squinted to see better, I could hear my heart pounding in my chest. This wasn't just a trick my eyes were playing on me in the dark. This was something real something undeniably real. And what's worse, it was moving towards me. It was still on land, but it had locked its gaze on me. I had no doubt this thing would get in the water to reach me, so I started swimming for the beach and the safety of the bonfire in the distance. The creature came into clearer view as it made its way down to the water. It was huge. It appeared to be able to walk on both two legs and four. It was on four legs now as it headed into the water. If I didn't know better, I would say it was a wolf, but when you really look at it, you can tell there is something wrong. The hind legs were a mixture of a man's leg and a dog's leg. They were larger than the front legs, so the creature walked similar to a bear when it was down on four legs. 
but it had the unmistakable head of a wolf. If that wasn't bad enough, it had these yellow eyes that glowed like yellow flames. I had heard of the dog man before, but I had never believed the stories. But what else could this be? That was the only description it matched. I didn't know much about the stories at the time, or whether or not this thing was dangerous, but I don't think it had good intentions as it pursued me into the water. Adrenaline pumped through my veins as I splashed frantically to the shore. If I could just make it to the fire, I would find safety in numbers. Whatever the creature truly was, I couldn't imagine it attacking a large group like that, even if it were the most dangerous predator on the planet. Suddenly, I was back on the shore, and that horrible stench finally gave way to the smell of crackling wood and burnt marshmallows. But the sight of the dog man wasn't something I could shake so easily. My friends tried to shake me out of my frightened state, thinking that I had seen a bear, or worse, imagined the whole thing in a hypothermic hallucination. To this day, none of them believe me, but I know what I saw. I know it was real. This took place in Roan Mountain State Park, Tennessee. It was back in mid-July a few years ago. Let me pause here for a second and just tell you about Roan Mountain because it is something else. It sways between hauntingly beautiful and deceptively serene. When I was there, it was the middle of summer. It was uncomfortably hot in most places, but at Roan Mountain, the world was different. The air was clean and cool and carried that rich, earthy aroma that was only found in the forest. I'm a programmer by profession, and at times it's like I can almost feel the zeros and ones in my brain mingle with the bustling of city life. So, I decided to drive down to the state park to get away from everything. Just me in a duffel bag of camping gear, craving for some quiet. Upon arrival, I remember being taken aback by how green everything was. I mean, I had seen photos, but they didn't do the park justice. Not in the least. I spent the first day hiking around, absorbing as much of the peaceful atmosphere as I could. It felt invigorating, being closed off from the rest of the world. In the evening, I decided to set up camp near one of the hiking trails. For the most part, it was just your typical camping setup. Tent, small fire pit, camping chair, the works. I remember sitting there, the warmth from the fire playing on my face and just listening to the ambient sounds of the wilderness. I must have been sitting that way for hours, just staring blankly into the fire, but this tranquility didn't last long. At some point in the night, I remember peering into the fire and noticing that the flames seemed somehow different. They were devoid of their usual vibrant tones of yellow and orange, and were tinged with an iridescent, almost a teal hue. I struck it down then to maybe some log still being damp or something along those lines, but could not shake the eeriness from my mind. It was around that same time when things started to go downright bizarre. Just as I was pondering on the strange color of the flames, my senses perked up to an unfamiliar noise, a hum. It sounded almost mechanical in nature and was very much out of place in the quiet wilderness. I couldn't pinpoint its direction. It seemed as if it was coming from everywhere and nowhere at the same time. But I remember freezing up, my gaze locked onto the odd glow of the fire as the hum got louder and more intense. I wasn't exactly a woodsman, but I didn't have to be to know that the buzzing didn't belong to any ordinary beast of the forest. But there was a split gaping second of pure silence before everything around me seemed to change. The night sky suddenly had this weird sheen, like it was made of metal. It was like I wasn't on earth anymore, like I was in some sort of diorama. Picking up my flashlight, I scanned the area only for the blinding beam to illuminate nothing. What I felt next is somewhat of a struggle to describe. It was as if time slowed or even stopped completely. My perception of reality was off. I felt a buzz in the back of my head, like a swarm of bees had lodged in my brain. And then the tree line was suddenly bathed in pulsing neon lights. Like you were in downtown Nashville. There was something above me, but the blinding lights obscured it from my vision. All the silence of mere moments ago shattered into a turmoil of amplified insect noises, rustling leaves in that hum, reminiscent of a giant Tesla coil. Stunned, 
I dropped the flashlight. My rational mind was wrestling with the bizarre situation, but my gut instinct, the primal part of my brain, was screaming one word, run, and run, I did. Dashing away from my campsite, I slid between the trees, the blaring lights flashing intermittently between their thick trunks. I can't say exactly how long I ran, but at some point, the overwhelming noises receded into a murmur, and the lights seemed to dissipate. I dared to look back, only to find nothing. No lights, no sheen on the sky, no alien hum. Perplexed and panting, I stood in the fringe of the strange reality that had momentarily engulfed me. Navigating through the moonlit trail, I finally found my way back to the campsite come morning. My tent was untouched, the fire dwindled down to ashes, and everything was respectably ordinary. As if the spectacle of lights, the mechanical hum, they all just never happened. My experience at Roan Mountain left me with some profound thoughts. I don't want to be that crazy guy talking about aliens, but I don't have another explanation for it. There was something behind those flashing lights in the sky, and it wasn't anything from the natural world. Yeah, maybe it was some strange military craft, but then, explain everything else. How did it turn my campfire blue? And what was that strange metallic sheen coating the sky that night? I think there's something else out there. Maybe people don't want to talk about it, but it's there nonetheless. So, there I was, smack dab in the middle of the Saguaro National Park, Arizona, with a couple of my good buddies, Marcus and Benny. We had taken a couple of days off work and hit the road together for a good, old-fashioned, stargazing camping trip. It was spring, and the Milky Way stretched wide above the desert floor. There was no place else I'd have rather been. For a city kid like me, the park was an escape from suburban life. I remember the particular day well. The heavens sprawled above us that warm spring evening, scattered with countless stars. It was near perfect. Marcus, Benny, and I had been lifelong friends. Over the years, our shared interest in stargazing had kept us bonded, despite our differing lives. I was a systems analyst, Marcus worked for a law firm downtown, and Benny was a high school math teacher. But none of those grown-up career choices affected our love for a clear night sky and the mysteries it harbored. Benny was the first to set up his telescope, a high-tech piece of equipment he purchased on a teacher's salary. God bless his frugal living. I had opted for a less fancy option, while Marcus, as usual, spent the evening scanning the skies with his binoculars. The camaraderie, banter, and the chilly desert breeze made the evening memorable. As time passed, we mapped out constellations like Orion, Gemini, and Taurus. With every passing hour, the tranquility of the desert night seeped deeper into us. We were miles away from the nearest town. The only sounds were those of the desert's nocturnal denizens serenading us while we stargazed. We traded stories, talked about our work lives back home, and had a round of hearty laughs. The real world felt a million miles away. While focusing my telescope on Mars, I noticed an odd shimmer in the corner of my eye. It was a soft glow at the edge of my vision. I turned my head, squinting into the darkness, but didn't see anything out of the ordinary. Assuming I'd imagined it, I went back to fiddling with my telescope. As the night deepened and the fire started to die down, Benny cracked open a bottle of bourbon he'd bought along. The sky's glow, the desert's silence, a sip of whiskey, and the silhouettes of my friends against the stars. It was turning out to be a night to remember. Out there, under stars, we were oblivious to the odd spectacle we were about to witness. As we sat there, the bottle making its round, Marcus suddenly sat upright, squinting into the desert night, pointing at something in the distance. Guys, he gasped, look at that. Following his gaze, we saw it, a spherical object hovering above the cactus field, just about 500 yards from our campsite, metallic silver in color, it was reflecting the pale lunar light and shimmering softly against the night sky. It was absolutely unlike anything I'd ever seen before. It was immensely large yet dead quiet, just hanging there in the air, neither rising nor descending. Suddenly, the desert symphony seemed to quieten. The coyotes, the crickets, even the wind, 
as if nature held its breath with us. Benny too was frozen in place, his mouth wide open, like a kid who just saw his first magic trick. Marcus managed to get his binoculars up in disbelief. It's like time stopped, he whispered, watching it through the lenses. I couldn't digest what I was witnessing, but my inner geek screamed, this is a UFO. This saucer-shaped object started to glow, a dazzling array of light circling the rim. It was hypnotic. The way it hung in midair so effortlessly, it defied everything I knew about physics. After what seemed like an eternity, the object suddenly emitted a humming tone, an eerie mechanical sound that resonated through the silent desert night. Then, a blinding flash of light. It shot off to the east in an instant, the speed unimaginable. It soon vanished, leaving nothing but a trail of light that dissolved into the night sky's black canvas. And then, silence again. Our fire had died down, and we were left there, dumbstruck, staring at the point from which the peculiar object had vanished. It left us questioning the line between reality and fantasy. After a long stretch, we finally gathered our wits to express what we had just witnessed. Led by disbelief and some excitement, we started to debate whether what we'd seen was a meteor, a new stealth jet, or an honest-to-God extraterrestrial spacecraft. The next morning, we couldn't stop reliving the incident. Despite the initial disbelief, we couldn't believe the bizarre, awe-inspiring encounter. As dawn approached, we were pondering our own existence in the universe, and if we were truly alone. It was an experience that left us jumbled between the thrill of encountering the exotic unknown and the fascinated dread of its implications. It just goes to show, the mysteries of the cosmos still remain unfathomable and humbling, demanding respect from us down here on Earth.